everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you today. Those of you online, welcome to the service. So glad that you are here. Um, how many of you got the, uh, the notification of the Good Friday service last Friday? Yeah. Yeah. It didn't happen. It's this Friday. So, so hopefully you got the correction too. Uh, those things happen. Not very often, but occasionally they, there's a misfire. Um, so if you, if, you, for, if you don't have any idea what we're talking about and you, you want to know some of the information that's going on around here, actually accurate information most of the time, uh, be sure to download the app. And if you set the notifications, you get you know, timely information regarding even like yesterday when there was a change with the Easter extravaganza, uh, there are notifications that go out. But anyway, Friday, we got a false, false alarm uh, for Good Friday um, and then, then a, a retraction. So, um, but yeah, that's a great resource for you uh, just to stay up with what's going on. And uh, as Steph said, yesterday was just a phenomenal day of just engagement and serving in the community and so many volunteers. Thank you guys all for for showing up and being um, the hands and feet of Christ uh, in our community. So today is Palm Sunday, as you probably know, and it's, this begins the most significant week in the life of the church. Um, it is a profound, it has profound implications for our salvation and literally for the salvation of the world. Um, this week, literally every day, has immense weight uh, to it. And so uh, I would agree and, and also say to lean into this week and spend some time daily with, uh, with God and consider this journey that uh, these next eight days uh, will mean for Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of resources for that. Um, one of the things that I do in the mornings, and if you want to be a part of it, we'd love to have you. I do a morning Bible study uh, online, um, and so if you want to jump on, we'll be doing readings through uh, basically Lent um, Passion Week related readings. So that's every day at 6.50, but you can watch it later if you want, but it's on YouTube. It's the Unfiltered Bible Study, and you can uh, check it out. There are also many devotionals. Uh, that you can spend some time, as well as our journal that we uh, gave out uh, that went along with this series. So, but this, this week is significant, and just the sheer weight of time and space that the New Testament gives to this week should speak volumes to us about its significance. In the New Testament, a full one-third of the Gospels relate to this one week of Jesus' life. A third of the Gospels. Jesus, you know, lived 33 years, but a third of his story about his life and ministry is about this week that begins today because it's significant. Significant for us. It's significant for believers. It's significant for the salvation of the world. And this, this week is critical in so many ways because it is a reminder of what Jesus came to do. It's the fulfillment of his mission. It's the culmination of his three-year ministry that was all leading toward this. It's a fulfillment of so many prophecies. One of the prophecies that it is a fulfillment of is a prophecy that was recorded back in the book of Ezekiel chapter 34. And it was a prophecy that in chapter 34 of Ezekiel, it is a condemnation of the leadership of Israel in terms of their shepherding of the, God, of the people of God towards him, that they had failed at that responsibility, that instead of protecting and guiding and nurturing the weak and the vulnerable and the broken and the lost, they'd become self-consumed. And they become self-serving. And so God, through the prophet Ezekiel, is pronouncing a judgment. But in the midst of that judgment, and after he pronounces that judgment, he also announces the remedy, which is that one day he would come himself, and he would be the shepherd for the people. He would be the good shepherd that would appropriately and lovingly and caringly Lead people back to God. Jesus 
addresses that prophecy head on in John chapter 10. And today I want to help us do a couple of things. One, I want us to see or really hear what Jesus says about being, about he himself being the good shepherd. And then, and maybe more importantly, I want us to go a step beyond that and actually see Jesus being the good shepherd. How many of you know that there is a universe between what someone says and what they do? There shouldn't be always, but often there is. And in John chapter 10, we will see Jesus say some very significant, powerful things about what the good shepherd does and what he intends to do. But I also want us to see what he actually does. In John chapter 10, Jesus is refuting an accusation by showing what a good shepherd does. He's contrasting his life with what he's seeing religious leaders of the time doing. So it begins in chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, a passage that has been, meant a lot to me over the last several years. John chapter 10, let's look at it together, 1 through 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech used with them was used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And now for the second time, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I, third time, lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, fourth time, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority, now the fifth time, to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Jesus, at the beginning of this passage in John 10, he gives some basic instructions and points about shepherding, which was of common occupation. And Jesus says that they didn't understand what he was saying. It wasn't that they didn't understand shepherding and sheep and that relationship. What they didn't Understand, they didn't make the connection between that vocation and what Jesus came to do. They didn't put those two things together. And so Jesus gives some basic cliff notes of what shepherding is about that the shepherd the shepherd has a right to the sheep, and the watchman recognizes this. He lets the shepherd in. The sheep hear and they recognize their shepherd. Verse 3, he calls his own sheep by name. He knows which ones are his. 
and the sheep that are his know that they belong to him. Verse 3 as well. And the sheep follow their shepherd and will never follow a stranger. Verse 4. It seems like basic sheep herding information and kind of strange, but thanks, right? But Jesus isn't just talking about giving people lessons on sheep herding. He's building an analogy between that vocation and what he has come to do, namely fulfill the prophecy of Ezekiel 34. He has come to be the good shepherd for the sheep. And in this passage, there are several I am sayings. I am the door, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd. John 10 is a judgment on religious leaders of the time. And it's also a promise of what he has come to do as our good shepherd. And sometimes when we hear this analogy of shepherd and sheep, which he's the shepherd, obviously, his people, which means we are the sheep. But what I want you to see is this, that this does not mean that the sheep are worthless. This passage is not saying that sheep don't matter. In fact, it's just the opposite. This is saying that the sheep are valuable to the shepherd and even the robbers and the thieves know it. And the sheep are so valuable to the shepherd that he is willing to lay down his own life for sheep. Five times. He says it. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's how valuable we are in his eyes. I know the world can send us a lot of different messages about our value. It can send us a lot of different messages about our value based on any number of things. Based on what people say about us, how they make us feel, about what we have or don't have, about a lot of different things. But I want you to hear what Jesus has to say about you, and it is this. You are valuable to him. You matter to him, so much so that he would lay down his life for you. In fact, it was, Jesus says, it's this mission of laying down his life was a mission that was given to him by his father. Listen, by the triune Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, before the creation of the world, before there even was a fall, looking down through the corridors of time, knowing that there would be a fall and a need for redemption, God made a plan to bring you back to him. He would be a good shepherd that would come himself and guide you back. Yeah. Because you are sheep and so am I, it doesn't mean that you're inferior. It doesn't even mean that you're sheepish. Sometimes. <laughs> it means that you're valuable to him. Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The one who enters through him will receive new life. Just like we saw so vividly through the baptisms a few moments ago. A sign, a symbol of washing. The one who enters through that gate, everyone who enters through that gate will be saved abundant life that's why Jesus says the thief comes to steal kill and destroy but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly Jesus says over and over here that he is the good shepherd and he tells us in so many ways what that means what does it mean that he's a good shepherd means first of all he's personal Jesus through his analogy with the 
with shepherding, he's telling us, I am personal. I know your name. God is relational. You know, we, we don't, this doesn't really stop us in our tracks anymore. It really don't, doesn't phase us. But it's good to remember that when Jesus came on this earth, he talked to God and about God in ways that startled people. Do you remember when the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray? Do you remember the, you know, Jesus, when Jesus taught them to pray, how did he start that prayer? Our Father. Friends, that was startling. That is not how people generally talked about God. He was creator, he was sovereign Lord, he was sovereign king, he was majestic ruler, he was these high and lofty names. Jesus comes on the scene and says, this is how I want you to talk to God, our father, dad, the creator of the universe, the one who is the sovereign king, the ruler of all, all of those things which are absolutely true, but I want you to understand, he desires to relate to you and to me as father as dad. Jesus furthers that point by telling us as the good shepherd, he knows us. He calls us by name. Verse 14 and 15, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Verse 27, my, she- my sheep hear my voice and I know them. I want you to know, man, God knows you. He knows you intimately and he considers you valuable and worthy of his love. You may have been told a lot of things in life about earning love and deserving love and working for to be loved. But I want you to know that that's the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He came that you might have life. And so what is Jesus Jesus says, I loved you before you do anything. You can never do anything to make God love you more. And you can never do anything to make God love you less. He loves you. He contrasts himself with the hired hand. The hired hand, they care about the money. And this is, this is an indictment on religious leaders. But he says, I, I care about the sheep. You can tell a hired hand because when it comes between the wolf and the sheep, if you're a hired hand, the sheep are in trouble. But if you're an owner, if you're a shepherd, then you lay down your life for the sheep. You go the extra mile. You care about the people. You can tell the difference, man, between someone who cares about this mission and someone who cares about the paycheck. You can tell. You probably work with people. who You can tell if they care about the job they do or they just care about getting paid. You can tell the difference between a renter and an owner. Generally speaking, (laughs) you can tell a car that's been leased (laughs) with one that's been owned. I tell you, man, our our staff, I want to brag on them because they exemplify so often people who care about the mission. So yesterday, as you know, the extravaganza was moved to yesterday afternoon. Um, instead of in the morning, which is, seems to be a, mi- a minor shift, uh, but you might imagine there's a lot of moving parts with shifting things and times and all of that. Well, one of the, one of the things that was a, a piece of what we're going to be doing out there was we had these cards that, were, that had all the times of the events, and so we were giving out to all the people who came to the park. Well, that's great, except that they move the time. <laughs> and so then those 300 or 400, how many, 500 cards that were made were basically useless. Now, 
unbeknownst to me, several of our team came here Friday, which is their day off, to reprint and reproduce all of those cards and cut all of those cards out so that they were accurate for Saturday's event. I want to tell you something. That is indicative of behavior that people, of people who care about the mission. Because no one would have cared. Everyone would have understood if you just said, you know what? They changed it, changed it at the last minute. But when you have people that care, you can tell the difference. And Jesus says, you will be able to tell the difference between me, the good shepherd, and the hired hands. Because I, when it push comes to shove, I am willing to lay down my life for the sheep. And you know the thing that often endeared people to Jesus was the fact when they met him, they found someone that knew them. Do you remember the, the story of Nathaniel? He was a, a would-be disciple, and before he ever came to Jesus, Jesus said, now there is one, there is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel said, how did you know me? The Samaritan woman, John chapter 4, Jesus goes through Samaria, and there's a, a woman there, and he has this long conversation with her. And he tells her all about her life, and then she goes back to her own country, to her community, and she tells them about Jesus. And part of the, the, the primary thing she told them was this, come and meet someone who told me everything about myself, who knows me. He sees Zacchaeus, wee little man, sycamore tree. He sees Zacchaeus when no one else did. He said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. He knows me. He knows you. And he never forgets your name. He knows who you are. He knows you better than you know yourself. And Jesus says, I know them and they know me. Because we know in the depths of our hearts, we know when someone really knows us and we know in the depths of our hearts when we are truly known and loved. I used to have a philosophy professor that loved to mess with us. It's like, how do you know your mom loves you? <laughs> well, because she told me. How do you know she loved you? The reason we know certain things about love is not because fundamentally about what they say, although the saying words matters, but isn't it true? The way we know mom loves us, the way we know we are loved is not primarily by what someone says, it's by what? What they do. Their willingness to sacrifice, their willingness to care, their willingness to protect, their willingness to go the extra mile. That's how we know. So Jesus says, I know my sheep, and my sheep, they know me. He says, I'm strong. Verses 3 and 4, to him the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls them by his, his own sheep by name and leads them out. The good shepherd leads his sheep with strength. He guides them. It reminds me of the beautiful psalm, right? Psalm 23, for the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because he's strong. He's sufficient. You know, in our world, we talk a lot about what drives you, right? Ambition, power, recognition, self-worth. But I want to tell you something about whatever drives your life. Whatever is driving your life, we need to understand that anything that drives my life is a tyrannical master that will never be satisfied. It will never be happy. You will never have enough. You'll never be sufficient. You'll never go far enough, do enough. That driver will continually push you. 
That's why when Jesus comes on the scene, man, he never says, I'm, I've come here to drive the sheep. He doesn't. I've come to what? Lead the sheep. There is a night and day difference between being driven and being led. Because driving feels more like a push. <laughs> and leading feels more like a drawing. I will draw them. I will lead them. Jesus never leads us into sin. He never leads us anywhere. He is unwilling to go with us. Even when it's through the valley of the shadow of death, he will walk with us. The sheep do not listen to the voice of thieves and robbers, but they listen to the voice of the shepherd. Because it's a strong, securing, powerful voice. And Jesus is willing with his strength to guard and protect the sheep. The hired hand isn't invested, so when, the, when there's trouble coming, they're out. But the good shepherd is going to lay down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd, he's willing to put himself between you and your adversary. Think of that. In all of the trials and, and opposition you face in your life, all of the enemies that come at you, Jesus puts himself between you and your adversary. He's your guard. He's your protector because you're valuable to him. He lays down his life. He guards the sheep. He protects the sheep. Psalm 18, 2 says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my protection. Jesus says further, he's the provider. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. We sing about that sometimes, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You know, it's interesting because in this, past, in this, in this passage, Jesus uses these I am sayings a number of times. I am the door, I am the gate, I am the good shepherd. When we hear that, we, get, we, we fixate on the latter part, right? Good shepherd, door, gate. In the first century, you know what they got caught up on? The I am part. Because I am is a reference back to the name of God. It's a reference back to Genesis chapter 3 or Exodus chapter 3. When God appears to Moses at the burning bush and reveals his name. And he says to Moses, take off your sandals because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. And when Moses asks who he is, he says, I am that I am. I'm Yahweh. Which means I was, I am, and I forever will be. I exist. Permanently, forever. So when Jesus says, I am the door, we hear door, but they say, wait, I am the door? You are forever, always the door? Yes, I am Yahweh, the door, the entrance into the relationship with God. I am the entrance into eternal life. I am the good shepherd. I am, I was, I am, and I always will be. The good shepherd. So every time you see in the Bible those four capital letters, L-O-R-D, it's the four letters in Hebrew that are pronounced Yahweh. I am. Jesus is claiming to be God. And the reason Jesus can provide and give abundance is because he is the great I am. He is God in flesh. Back to the woman at the well. You remember the woman at the well? They have the long conversation and they're, they're at the well. She came there to, drink, to get water. Jesus asked her for water, for water. She's like, why do you ask me for water? Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> 
And Jesus said, if, if you knew who it was that was speaking to you, I am, then you would ask him for water and he would give you what? Living water and you will never thirst again. Because he is the I am. He is sufficient. He has access to everything. The reason he can promise abundance is because of who he is. Jesus is identifying himself as the great I am. He can provide because of who he is. There are several other things that Jesus says about who he is in this passage, and you probably could find more. But he says he's a savior. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Several times, as I said, he says this. Whoever follows me will be saved. He's the savior. We also see that he seeks. He's a seeker. He seeks other sheep. He seeks those who are far from God. When we talk about around here going after the one, that family member, that friend, that coworker, that neighbor that doesn't, that doesn't have a relationship with God. And maybe some of those relationships, they, it, it, you have a burden because you care about those folks and you see their lives and you want to see them come to Christ. You want to see them experience new life because you know how beneficial it will be to their lives. And what I want you to know is that that burden that you're carrying, you're not alone in that burden because God himself is restless until he sees all of his sons and daughters come home. I have other sheep that are not of this fold and I must bring them also. Don't be offended by this, but this passage reminds me of my dog. <laughs> my, my dog is, uh, is, not, is not content until everyone's in their place. <laughs> right? And everyone now is basically me and Christy, right? <laughs> so until Christy and I are in our right places, Wesley is, is not, ha he's, he's not content. He's, he's nervous. He's anxious. And in a similar way, God is not content until his lost sons and daughters come home. And I want to say, like, if this, if this dog reference, like, freaks you out, I want to encourage you. There's a, I wasn't the first one to do this. There's a poem you've got to read. It's called The Hound of Heaven, Francis Thomas. It is powerful. It's powerful. 182 lines, and it talks about God's unrelenting pursuit of your soul. His unrelenting pursuit of your soul. John 10, I must get them back. I must bring them home. As we wrap up, I want to shift gears a little bit because as we started, it's one thing to say these things, which are very encouraging, maybe inspiring um, about the good shepherd, that he's personal, that he's a savior, that he's provider, that he's personal, all these things. It's one thing to say that. But it's another thing to show that. It's one thing to, for someone to say that they're good and noble and powerful and sacrificial. It's quite another thing to demonstrate goodness and nobility and power and self-sacrifice. Jesus claims to be the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. But up to this point in his ministry, he hasn't had to. So when the moment came 
when he would have to, would he? What Jesus promised in less chaotic times, like those we just read and talked about and elaborated on uh, on from John chapter 10, how would those flesh out in more chaotic times, in warring times, when it ultimately would matter? So I encourage you to invite you to hold this in your mind. Jesus' words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And just one chapter later, Jesus is on trial and Caiaphas, the high priest, spoke up and said to his colleagues, Jesus is not present, You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as a high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, not only for that nation, but for also the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. A few days later, Palm Sunday the triumphal entry. The next day, a great crowd had come for the festival because they heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey. The irony is that the people, while saying the right things, do not have the right image in mind of what Jesus has come to do. He is the king. He is coming. But he is not the kind of militant, military ruler that they had in mind. He's coming in a very different way. Like a good shepherd. In John chapter 12, Jesus is in Gethsemane praying deeply. Listen to what he says. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, that's what hired hands do. When the moment comes to lay down your life for the sheep, Father, should I even pray that you remove this from me? No, that's what hired hands do. I am the good shepherd. For this purpose, he says, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. This is war, spiritual war. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. This is Jesus at war with the very enemy of humanity that has been antagonizing the human race since the beginning of creation. It is for this hour that he has come not only to die, but to crush the works of the enemy. And so Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth... I will draw all people to myself. Jesus continuing to pray in John 17, what is known as the high priestly prayer of Jesus. He says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Why in the world would Jesus have joy in the midst of his most horrific suffering? I want to tell you, the reason Jesus has joy in the midst of his suffering is because he loves the sheep. And what is driving him forward is because it's for the joy that is set before him, not only a joy of doing the Father's will, but it's the joy of a shepherd who loves the sheep and is willing to lay down his life for them. So Jesus says, I have given them your word and, your, and, your, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them. 
from the evil one. Do you hear the heart of the shepherd praying to the Father, even as he is about to war against the enemy to protect the sheep? They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Now watch this. For them, I sanctify myself. What is this? For them, I consecrate myself to this mission. For them, that they too may be truly sanctified. Chapter 19, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in purple and a purple robe and went up again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe, Pilate said, here's the man. Saying you're a good shepherd and doing it are different things. Verse 17, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. I want to suggest to you that the sign could have just as truthfully read, Jesus of Nazareth, the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus not only talked about it, he did it. And when push came to shove and he could have called heaven's angels to deliver him from the time of suffering, his response was, why in the why, Father, would I ask for this to be removed from me? It is for this hour that I have come and it is before the joy set before me that to see every single one of those lost sons and daughters united into the fold under one shepherd that I hope that they can experience the joy that I'm experiencing now. I don't know what's driving you, man, but I am deeply concerned about what's leading you. Is it the good shepherd? Is he leading you? Have you entered into that gate, through that gate? That is Jesus. The one who not only talked about it, but did it for you. Things that drive us will never be satisfied, but the good shepherd is for you and with you and goes before you. My prayer is that you'll let him lead you. And the question then for each of us is, will we follow? Would you stand with me? Let us pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your love, your love and grace and forgiveness, your goodness. Lord, thank you for the way you express that to us in your word, the way you express that to us through your Holy Spirit that embraces us with the love of God. Lord, we pray that we would continually tune our ear to hear your voice above all others. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your life for us. Lord, I pray for each and every person here and if there's anyone here who's never committed their life to you, who has not put their faith and trust in you as the leader of their lives, I pray that today they would. 
Lord, may they sense your heart that is in pursuit of them for their good. God, I pray for each and every person, not only in this room, but the sound of my voice online. Lord, may we fall more in love with you. May we desire.